Hi everyone. Um, we are uh, we're in the the webinar started just a little bit early. We'll, we'll wait till um, it's exactly 7 p.m. to really jump into everything. But wanted to let you all know that we're here and that we're excited to have you uh, joining us for um, Change of Tune. And in the um, meantime, if you could please get um, on your phone or tablet and go to Kahoot.it. It's on the screen, Kahoot.it. We're going to be playing a game throughout the presentation, so I'd like everyone to get there. Por favor. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, uh, you may not have been expecting it, but we're going to have an interactive piece to this webinar. Um, we'll, have a, we'll have a quiz going on throughout it. Uh, don't worry, though. I think the, the question should be, shouldn't be too many curveballs for anybody. Um, also, just a heads up, uh, if you have any questions at all during the, the presentation, uh, feel free to ask them in the GoToWebinar um, question panel, and uh, so just type them in, and then we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on those, and we'll uh, answer those throughout the webinar. So feel free at any time to ask a question. All right. So we are right at 7 p.m. Um, so let's we'll jump into it. Um, so we're going to go through and introduce uh, who is on the um, the panel today. Uh, my name is Greg Collette, and I am the senior affiliate challenge master for uh, fine arts this year, um, which means that I, I work around the the state, um, especially at the the state. Um, tournament to help run run the challenge. Um, I also am a regional challenge master for North Metro, and um, I am a former team member. I've been doing DI now. I think it is 20 years as of this year. Um, so yep, that's my uh, that's my background. I'll uh, pass it off to Marta. Hi, I'm Marta. I'm also an affiliate challenge master. Um, the regional challenge master for Denver. Um, I think I'm right around with Greg about 20 years of doing DI. I started as a team member and have moved up in the ranks. Um, please play along in Kahoot. This is new, so there might be a little, a few snagoos, but I'm excited to try this out. So, And then Barb is our most affiliated challenge master. Okay. Um, so my name's Barb. I am a first year affiliate challenge master, but I have, like you, spent many, uh, many years as a team manager. I was a school coordinator, and I've been working as regional challenge master with South Metro for the last few years. Um, so I'm excited to start as affiliate challenge master and uh, can't wait to get started on this. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for for joining us this evening. Um, as I mentioned a couple minutes before, for everybody, if you have any questions at all during the presentation, feel free to ask them using the Go to Webinar uh, question feature. Um, we'll uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation. We'll uh, we'll uh, stop whenever we see a question and we'll uh, answer it. So feel free anytime. And then. Uh, uh, for everybody too, uh, Marta is going to, we have an interactive feature for this webinar and uh, Marta is going to explain it a little bit more. Okay, um, hopefully everybody is on Kahoot.it as well as being able to see the screen share that's happening right now. Oop, somebody raised their hand. Yep, <laughs> thanks Amita. Keep going? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what we'll do is everybody, if you're on Kahoot.com, please put in this pin right after it loads. Give it a second, please. Okay. And once everybody's logged in, I'll start seeing your names. And once we've got the names up and going, we'll start the presentation. 
Thanks, Faith. Awesome. Thanks, Faith. All right. Hi, Tony. Hi, Barb. Candy, hello. Awesome. Anna, hello, hello, hello. Wow, we've got a lot of participants. Okay, let's hope this works. All right, do we have anyone else coming on? You think we're good? Yeah, I think we should be good. Do we have a question? Um, I'm just trying to help Amita with her sound. So, uh, uh, okay. yeah. All right, let's go ahead and start. So first, oop, we've got more people adding up. All right, everybody can see their names on the screen, I hope. If not, please let Greg know and he'll help you through that. All right, we're going to start. So the first question is just a practice one. It's going to tell you to choose the color corresponding on your phone. So whenever you see the red answer on your phone, please click it. Each question is 20 seconds long. Please read through the numbers, look at the screen for the question, and then click the corresponding answer on your phone. Hmm. I don't know if that worked. Did everybody? Greg, do you want to unmute people so they can give us some questions on this before we start? Um, probably easier to just have, uh, if anybody has any questions, just put it in the, the question box. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're good. Does everybody understand it? Can you guys type in the chat yes or no? I think it might work better once we get started with it. I did not see anything that indicated what color to choose. Okay. All right, well, so this is our first time trying out the quiz, everybody. So uh, uh, we appreciate you all being our guinea pigs. Uh, <laughs> all right. Either way, if we, you guys can't answer the questions, no problem. We can still go through the presentation. So we're going to start off with... Um, who are your affiliate challenge masters? So we've right. got Kate, Red, Barb, Blue, Marta, Yellow, or Greg, Green. So choose any one of those that uh, is an affiliate okay. challenge master. Okay, it's working. People are answering. Okay, this is going to work. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, technically all the answers are correct other than Kate. She is the regional... Um, She's the coach. affiliate director. She's the uh, affiliate director for the state. Executive of director. Yep. And we all love her very, very much. You can't have Kate is Yeah, awesome. without her. All right, let's get into the challenge. So, who should you contact your read or when should you contact your regional challenge master? So, red when you have a tax question. Blue, when you have a destination imagination question or concern. Uh, gold, uh, when you need 200 pounds of ice cream. Or green, when you need to find a good vacation spot. Like I said, these, uh, these answers shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. I'm glad everybody got that one right. Um, so yeah, uh, just wanted to start off by saying that we are here to help you guys um, our regional challenge masters are great resources. Um, they're going to be a great resource to start with if you have any questions. Um, any questions at all, feel free to reach out to them. They're a great team. Um, if you, you can always start with the affiliate challenge masters with us as well. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, um, have all of this ready for anybody who needs it um, if you don't catch it on this screen. Uh, but yeah. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're more than happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. So next question. What does success mean in DI? Uh, uh, so red, been... Getting through a meeting without crying. Blue, the kids solved the challenge. Yellow, the team made it to state. And green, the team members decided their definition of success. So which, whichever one you think. Oh, 
All righty. So actually, all of the answers are correct. Um, we have the slide up here because success really does mean something different to every kid in the program. And we want to make sure that they feel comfortable no matter what they're going through. Um, sometimes it's just making it to state. Sometimes it's making it throughout a team meeting without crying. I remember when we were in middle school, <laughs> it was boys against girls all the time, and we had a lot of fights and a lot of crying. Um, a good project to do with your kids is at some point throughout the year, sit down with them and ask them what does success mean to them when it comes to DI, just so that at the end of the year you can say, well, this is what you guys wanted to accomplish at the beginning of the year, this is what you accomplished at the end of the year, do you guys feel successful? Um, we really do want to strive with everybody and all the kids feeling success successful. All right, yeah. let's move on to the next question. Nice job, Alanis. All right, which of the following is not a special award? Uh, Red Da Vinci, Blue Spirit of Discovery, Yellow Renaissance, and Green Impressionist. I'm sorry. Greg, you're supposed to be doing these things. Yeah, no, no <laughs> worries, no worries. <laughs> Team effort. Um, yeah, so which which of these is not? All right, so it is Impressionist is not a special award. So we have, um, for DI, we have three special awards, um, the Da Vinci, the Renaissance, and the Spirit of Discovery. Um, the Da Vinci is really for innovation. Um, one of the big things, and kind of going back to the, the discussion about success. One of the big things that we really want to emphasize to the kids in DI is that it's okay to it's okay to fail. Um, that innovation and creativity inherently comes with risk, and it's something that we want the kids to be comfortable with taking those risks. So Da Vinci's a, the Da Vinci Award really is to award um, risk takers in DI, whether that's um, a technical element that they create or it's a um, type of presentation that they do, something that has the possibility of not, it hasn't been done before and has the possibility of not um, actually succeeding, um, but is something new and creative. Um, then on the flip side is the Renaissance Award, which is uh, awarded for uh, technical excellence is usually how um, I like to describe it. Really it's something where the design for a, a technical element or the choreography or the, um, the prop design, whatever it is, was just done with such excellent uh, excellence that it performs exactly as it should. Um, and so this also wants to, uh, this award is to to recognize those teams that um, that really spent a lot of time making sure that whatever their method was was reliable and um, was going to succeed no matter what type of uh, potential challenges that they might run into day of. Um, and then the Spirit of Discovery Award is really something to it's a it's a way to recognize those teams that. Uh, that show um, strength in the face of adversity. A lot of times, it's uh, it, a lot of times great sportsmanship is rewarded with the spirit of discovery. Um, a lot of times, uh, teams that had something just and if you've been a team manager before, you you probably experienced that just something goes wrong um, the day of the challenge, and yet they still persevere. And still move forward and support each other. Really, spirit discovery um, is about the collaborative aspect of DI and really recognizing those teams that um, teams are individuals that uh, really exemplify that collaborative and not just it's for really to show that DI isn't just about the competition part. And and all these awards can be either awarded to a team. Um, a few individuals on the team, uh, multiple teams, uh, or just a single individual on the team. So it's a great way to go beyond just the scoring of the challenge and 
instant challenge and the uh, the team choice elements to really to really emphasize some of the key values of DI. And just uh, as a side note, the spirit of discovery is also awardable to uh, parents, members of the audience. That's really mm -hmm. a yep. all encompassing award for everyone who participates in DI. Next. Tony, nice job. All right, what is the role of a team manager? Is it to uh, do, create, interpret, teach, guide, mentor, provide snacks and drinks, or handle the table saw, sewing machine, chemicals, etc.? Excellent. Everybody, everybody got it right. So, um, yeah, the role of the team manager, one of the ways to really kind of think of yourself as a team manager is as a facilitator. You're there to, to be a project manager for the team. You're not the one implementing or creating or designing. You're just really there for um, general support and uh, to help, you know, with <laughs> You know, providing snacks and drinks is is also a key role of, um, of the team manager, or at least getting the parents to help provide snacks and drinks. Um, really, your purpose is to create a safe space where the kids can explore and learn and fail, and really help them reach their success, but not. Um, designing or creating anything for them. So um, it's by far one of the most important role that we have and thank you all for for joining and for being a team manager. I mean, we, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it and you guys are the ones that made DI what it is. Um, so yeah, it's just the team manager role is crucial and it really is, you guys are there to to help the kids facilitate them in their growth throughout the year. Tony's still in the lead. Okay. All right. So which activity is considered interference? Helping building the helping build the set, teaching the kids how to sew, taking the kids to the museum, or introducing the kids to a ballerina. So which one is considered interference? Excellent. So yeah, helping build the set is the, uh, uh, definitely considered interference. Uh, again, going back to the idea of your role as a facilitator, you're helping the kids explore and try out new skills, um, helping them find, uh, find their passions essentially, or things that they want to improve upon. Um, you know, your role is to is a great way to help the kids really learn some of those fundamental skills. So I think sewing is a good example where there's two types of skills that the kids can really learn throughout the throughout the um, the year. One on one hand is more the technical skill like sewing, um, and that's something that uh, they can they can be taught uh, because it has so many applications and they can use that uh, to help create their story and create their presentation, but that doesn't mean that you are um, creating the presentation for them. On the other side of things, you have your more abstract skills. So some of the ones that really DI is designed to emphasize are things like uh, creative problem solving, uh, resource gathering, research. Um, so it's a great opportunity, especially, especially in those beginnings to really to really let the kids figure out what what skills that they need to learn, um, and you can help them, uh, you know, really be a sounding board for ways that they can find it and learn those skills. Uh, so, um, yeah, really, really, your role and all the resources roles for the kids is to to be there to teach them fundamental skills, um, but not not be the ones that, you know, do the, um, create the actual challenge for them. 
I mean, one thing kind of going back to the one of the quite the previous question, one of the answers, which uh, was using the table saw uh, for the kids. I think this is something that's always a good good point to touch on for interference. So, as a team manager, you there's two air two times where you can more or less it, it's not interference, but where you can step in uh, when the team is creating their challenge. One of those times is if there's a safety concern. So if the kids, if you don't feel that the kids are can use a tool safely or um, they're looking at a solution that you don't think that they can execute safely, that's a, a point where you as a team manager, that is part of your role is to step in and stop them from doing that. Now, having said that, then it's not your job to then do that solution for them. Instead, the team should reevaluate whatever their solution, whatever they're trying to accomplish, and find a way that they can accomplish it safely within their means, or find a new solution um, to their overall uh, goal. So, yeah, safety number one—that's a big key piece of your role. Then the other part where a team manager can step in uh, to the team is if if you feel that their presentation and their solution that there is an element or as a whole it's inappropriate uh, for their age level for uh, for DI in general that is a place where you can step in as well um, and make an executive decision that uh, they need to find another solution um, or another way to present their solution so those are two pieces two areas where as a team manager that you can step in and, and change the direction of the team but other than that you're really there to just um, create a safe environment for them to uh, and let me just clarify on that last point that Greg said where um, if you guys think that the solution is inappropriate we're talking about inappropriate as in school policy doesn't allow to bring any type of weapons into the school and the kids are saying that they're going to bring in fake swords. That's where you step in and say, hey, school policy doesn't allow it. What's another way that you guys can get your point across without breaking the school policy? So you're not asking that, you're not telling them what to do or changing their solution for them. You're just explaining school policy doesn't allow weapons. I hope that clarifies it just a tad. Okay, next question. All right, so how does interference affect the team? Uh, team could be disqualified, team will have a better solution, team could get a deduction, the score will not be affected. All right, so the correct answer is the team could get a deduction. I think one thing to one way to really think about um, how interference is uh, is handled during um, during the scoring uh, during the tournament is that our goal is essentially interference is there to to encourage to make sure that the kids are the ones creating the solution that um, their solution isn't being uh, elevated by the help of uh, parent, friends, family. Um, and so the way that interference, when interference is noted and assessed, is that the appraisers will score as if there is no interference whatsoever. They will score on what they saw in the presentation and the questions that they asked the kids later. Um, and then after those scores are put in, then they will discuss how much the interference affected the um, or either the overall presentation or specific elements within the presentation. So say it was a um, specific set piece that likely would be, um, those points would be deducted from the, uh, probably from the theatrical portrayal of the presentation. Um, so really the goal is to, with deductions, is to evaluate the to help evaluate better evaluate the the presentation um, had that interference not happened 
So it is a subjective decision on the uh, appraiser's part, um, and it really depends on how much they feel that the interference affected the overall solution to the challenge. All right. Good job, Tony. People are catching up though. Okay. All right, so uh, now we're gonna go to the day of the regional competition. Um, where won't the team present the solution? In a classroom, on the moon, in an auditorium, in the gym. Like I said, uh, yeah, not, not, really too many, <laughs> not too many curveballs for anybody, hopefully. All right, <laughs> good job everybody, it will not be on the moon. Um, so something to keep in mind and something that definitely you can discuss with the kids and you want the kids to discuss with themselves, uh, between themselves, is that they, um, they could be performing anywhere. Um, they could be performing in a gym, auditorium, a classroom. Uh, really the only requirements that they have um, if you if you have your um, if you have the challenge on hand, um, oh, and for anybody, if you don't have the challenge on hand, if you go to the drop down on the on go to webinar, there should be a drop down that says handouts. Um, the challenge as a PDF is in that drop down on your control panel. Um, so if you if you have your your challenge up. Um, on page five, it has information about the tournament and what the, the tournament will be like. So really the only requirements at the tournament are that the, the team has a presentation that is at least 10 feet by eight feet, which um, when, you, when you actually measure that out on the ground is much smaller than you would expect, um, something for the kids to really keep in mind. Um, they could be on a variety of floor surfaces, so it could be hardwood, it could be carpet, um, it could be linoleum. It, it really depends on the site. Um, and uh, then the only other pieces that they'll have will be, or that will be provided, will be a three-prong electrical outlet. Uh, a lot of the locations will likely have a uh, extension cord, but that's not guaranteed at any of the um, any of the facilities, and then um, they will have standard doors. So um, something for the kids to also keep in mind that their props need to be able to fit through a standard size door. Um, they're not guaranteed double wide doors. They're not guaranteed um, any uh, any extended area. So something that they need to consider. There may be steps that they have to get up. There may be steps they have to go down. Um, just something really, this is an opportunity for the kids to think through uh, plan A, plan B, and plan C uh, of what might potentially happen. Um, so just something for them to keep in mind. A couple other key pieces with the um, how the setup is going to be. So what we have on screen is of a, a general, um, a general setup that you you'll see often, but isn't guaranteed by any means. Um, with the prep area in the lower right or the lower left hand corner, uh, the teams something to keep in mind. Anybody can move the team's props into the prep area, so uh, you can help. Uh, family members can help into the prep area. Once they're in the prep area, though. Um, hands off of those props. The kids will, their time will start. Um, they will start in the prep area. The timekeeper announcer will start their time and then part of their time is moving their props from the prep area to the performance area. You mean oh, stage area? So, yeah, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, actually. Reverse, or just forget what I just said. Prep area is where they're going to uh, be talking to the um, prep appraiser. Uh, staging area is where you can move in the um, in the props, and that is where they're going to start. They're going to be when the, the time starts for the presentation. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes the staging area is also called the launch area. Oh, um, that's what of, I was supposed to be. My bad. 
um, a couple other things. Uh, the appraisers will likely sit right in front of the performance area, but they may get up, they may move around to get a better view. Um, the appraisers will each be, they won't be appraising every single um, piece of the challenge. They'll have specific pieces that they're focusing in on, so they may get up to look, um, to get a better angle at a particular element of the challenge. Uh, having said that, they will not interfere with the presentation itself. Um, so yeah, we'll jump on to the next question. Oh, um, anyway, real quickly, we have a question uh, from Tony. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> good comment, or good point, Tony. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they will be able to, uh, and we'll get into that for the central challenge. They can set their presentation anywhere that they would like uh, for this challenge. Okay, right. my turn? Yes. All right, <laughs> how many scoring elements are in the central challenge? Uh, three, four, five, or two. I think we moved a little quickly, so I'm sorry for the people's win streaks that have suffered a little bit. All right. There are, how many are there? There are. Okay, there are four different scoring elements on this. Um, the first one is called the musical. Um, it's really the story that the kids write. Um, they have to create and present a two-act musical that create a story. Um, a musical is a play that includes music and lyrics to help tell the story. They have to divide that musical into two acts and create a division between act one and act two. It has to include a change in plans in the story and it can be in any location or time period that the team chooses to do. The second element is music and lyrics. Um, they have to use music and lyrics to help tell the story. The music and lyrics have to be in both acts and it's really up to the team to decide how much they actually want to put into this. Um, if they want the whole thing to be musical, it can be. Um, there's no restriction on what kind of genre or style of music or lyric. They need to design and create all of the music and lyrics using their own ideas and skills. However, they can use commercially prepared music and lyrics, but for scoring, the appraisers are only going to consider what's been created or modified by the team. So the kids do not have to be musical prodigies or know how to sing or play instruments. There's lots of ways that kids can produce music. So it's really up to the team to kind of research what is available, to think about the music that they know and come up with their own ideas. Um, music and lyrics that are pre-recorded by the team are permitted in this challenge, but there are some rules in Rules of the Road that you need to be aware of. And it's really not meant to replace a live performance, but they are, they are, it will be acceptable to record some things. It has been in Rules of the Road for a long time that if teams choose to record and they record most of their presentation. If the appraisers feel that they've recorded too much ahead of time, their scores could be affected um, and they just won't score as high. They will not get a deduction for that because it is allowed, but they won't get as much as if it's performed live. It's really the intent of this challenge that they will perform as much as possible live. Um, the third thing they're going to do is what's called a spectacle. And what we really hope to see is something that shows 
a show-stopping event. Sort of like if you think about uh, the beginning of La La Land, if you were able to see that movie, and there was much going on during that. The spectacle um, could be something like that, or it could be a very small, quiet moment also. It's really up to the team to decide what they see as an unforgettable event in the, um, in the musical that is also important to the story. So it sort of advances or gives you more information about what's going on. <clears throat> um, the team needs to research production techniques and I don't know if you want me to read all of the production um, techniques. We'll get into on. that. We'll get into that in like two questions. Okay. Um, they need to combine two production techniques that are from the list on this is see the spectacle number uh, three. They're going to combine two of these they can use as many as they'd like, but only two that you're going to list for the appraisers will be will be um, scored under this section. Um, the spectacle has to be presented live on the stage. So that's one of those things where we say it can be recorded, um, but be careful what you record, because if too much of it is recorded, it could harm their, or at least affect their scores. And then the fourth element is a set change. They need to have some kind of background, scenery, or props that in some way changes and transforms. Uh, they need to use technical methods. Uh, so this is the technical piece of this challenge. Um, the set change should be visible for a, a distance of at least 25 feet, and it must not be part of the spectacle. So the change can't occur during the spectacle. Um, the set, if it fails to operate, your team will earn zero points for theatrical effect. However, they still can get points for technical design and technical innovation. Um, based on the technical methods that they use. If for some reason there's, um, their set change fails, the appraisers at the end of the scene will, at the end of the eight minute period, will ask the kids to demonstrate what they had in mind and they are still eligible to get points in that area. Okay, those are the four. All right, uh, there's a question. Okay. Is there a question? Oh, no, I think we're good. Okay, next. All right. Uh, All right. What is not scored in the okay. musical? What is not Okay, having two acts, a division scene, the story, or the location of the story. Nice. Oh. Wow, that's great. Everybody was paying attention, yes. They made <laughs> location, time period, anything like that is up to the team. Any questions on the first part of the scoring the musical? All right. All right, music and lyrics, which element is scored? The frequent use of music and or lyrics, the genre of music chosen, the use of music and lyrics to help tell the story, or using commercially produced music. All right. Number six, the use of, okay, the use of music and lyrics to help tell the story. Um, most of you got that right. So the music needs to help along that story as you go. Any questions about that? I think um, something to, to kind of, uh, let's see here, real quick. 
We have a question from uh, Karen. So, uh, my team is using their voices for their music. Is making up a song and words sufficient, or do they need instruments other than their voice? So, that's a good question, Karen. Um, I would jump back to so the scoring for the challenge for music and lyrics, the, the two pieces are going to be integration of the music and lyrics into both acts and the creativity of the music and lyrics. Um, so for both of those questions, there's nothing inherent, or both of those scoring elements, there's nothing inherent in them that says that instruments are required to enhance it. Um, I think something to really key in on for for integration, um, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but um, down the spectacle, there's also a scoring for integration. And the way that it's described in the scoring element is this means that the spectacle is important to the story. And I would um, say the same thing for music and lyrics, uh, that the music and lyrics need to be important to the story. Uh, one way to think about it is if you pull out the music and lyrics, can this, does the story still stand on its own? If it does, then they may not be as important to the story and helping telling the story um, as you might have thought. So something for the team to really consider is that how much of a role do they music and lyrics play in telling the story? And that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be using an instrument or instruments to, um, to do that. And same right, as long as there's a melody, you still have music. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's a beat and not necessarily a change in, um, you know, notes going higher or lower, I mean, that's, you know, research what music means. If there's a beat, it's music. And, and we'll, we'll also um, talk a little bit later in the presentation. Um, something that's going to be critical and is always critical every every year with every challenge is uh, the, your paperwork, what the kids fill out in the paperwork. Um, if, they're, if they have an interpretation of music that may not necessarily be the norm, but if they define it well in their paperwork, that will give the, uh, the appraisers a jumping off point to really, to really appreciate whatever they're trying to do. So, so we'll, we'll get into paperwork a little bit later, but it is something that, that is a key area where to communicate to the appraisers the kids' understanding and grasp of whatever their definition is, same with genres of music. Um, none of the appraisers are going to be experts in music genres. Um, like, a, like Barb mentioned earlier, we're not going to be appraising the kids on their singing abilities or their instrument playing abilities. Um, it's really going to be on how they integrate it and the creativity of those music and lyrics. Any more questions? Are we good? All right. Thanks, Karen. All right, the spectacle. Which combination of proje production techniques would not fulfill the requirement? Acrobatics and costumes, set dressing and lighting, physical theater and pantomime, makeup and costumes. Good job. I thought that was going to be a trick question. Right. I get. I, you guys are fast <laughs> on the draw. <laughs> um, lighting is one of the one of the production techniques, but set dressing is not. Everything else is on the list, and. Um, when we were trying, when I was, I was actually on the uh, writing team for this challenge. We wanted to call this the showstopper, and um, DI decided it would not translate well into other languages, and so they came up with spectacle. Um, but that's what we're looking for. So think about the shows that you've seen. Think about um, plays that you've gone to. Um, take the kids to see a play or watch a lot of old things on TV, um, especially this time of year. A lot of the old movies being replayed have some pretty spectacular things that go on uh, 
that's what we're looking for and they're going to use two different things combine these two they can use as many as they want um, but they own, they have to choose two that they feel are integrated the best into their um, spectacle and um, each year we have a slight issue with this make sure that they understand that we need to be able to see and hear the spectacle from at least 25 25 feet away. Just yeah, a we're quick not, little reminder. Yeah, we're not we're not gonna get out of measuring tape, but it's a good it's a good rule of thumb for the kids um, to think about that either it's visible and or it's audible from that distance. Um, mm -hmm. something else to note too going back and I'm gonna start hammering this in for everybody, <laughs> um, is that paperwork is gonna be key for your production techniques. Um, it's the paperwork asks what those production techniques on the are going to be, and so that that needs to be there. That's something that if the the production techniques aren't aren't uh, uh, mentioned on the paperwork or aren't shown on the paperwork, then the appraisers can't score, and um, they, they will do their best to to ask the the team what their production techniques are. Prep will do their best to get that information, but it does slow down the process of everything. Um, and also that's an opportunity. So these are pretty, these production techniques are pretty broad. Acrobatics um, is a pretty broad, def can have a pretty broad definition. So this is an opportunity for the kids to, to do research uh, and to come to their own definitions of what these production techniques mean. And that's something that they'll need to show on the paperwork and in questions that the appraisers have after their presentation. Um, so that's an opportunity for the kids again to, to really to really find something new and explore it more. All right, next question. Not as in lead. All right, the set change, which is not one of the scoring elements in this section. Theatrical effect, theatrical perfection, technical design, and technical innovation. Okay, excellent job. Theatrical perfection, although that would be lovely, is certainly not something we're there being scored on. Um, any questions on the set change? Good to go. Set um, change would actually be even a prop that changes in some way. It doesn't have to be an entire piece of scenery that changes into something else. As long as one thing changes, then they've met the minimum requirements. Now, if they want to make it, you know, a bigger set change, that's up to the team. A couple, a couple other points too of the set change as well. Um, another, another term that's used in the set change is technical methods. Again, this is an opportunity. There are examples in the challenge of, uh, you know, as it states in the challenge, technical methods refers to the use of principles in fields such as chemistry, computer science, electricity, hydraulics, mathematics, mechanical engineering, physics, and or structural engineering. Other technical fields are also acceptable. So again, this is an opportunity for the team to define their terms, to learn what a technical method is, discover new technical methods, um, and really to just explore. Again, the paperwork is going to be key for the, the kids to emphasize what a technical method is. Um, usually, I like to, to explain a tech, something that's technical as some, some tool that allows an uh, individual to do something that they couldn't that isn't physically possible without that tool. Um, so, you know, it can be as broad ranging as clothing. Clothing is a technology um, to a, a pulley system, to a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, it's a pretty, again, it's a pretty broad category and it's really gonna be up to the team to, to research and define what technical method means to them. 
I think really kind of the, the big things is that it's not just um, a team member picking up and moving something. Um, they can say, not to say that it can't be uh, human powered, like a, like a pulley system, um, but it, it does need to have some kind of technology that, that accomplishes something or allows the team to accomplish something that they couldn't otherwise. All right. Are we ready for the next question? Yeah. Okay. Um, what percentage of your overall score comes from the team choice elements? Twenty five percent, sixty percent, fifteen, or thirty five? Barb, did you want to talk about this one or would you like me to? Um, I didn't, I don't see numbers on here, so I wasn't sure if I was still doing this one or not. 15% um, is the correct answer, which quite a few of you got. Um, and the team choice elements are really things that um, the kids get to actually choose two areas in their skit that they would like to have scored. It must be something um, that is not being scored anywhere else. Um, and it's whatever the team chooses. So it, it's an area of strength for them. Um, if they have something that they um, have worked very hard on, if it's part of a, let's say it's part of the set, it can be part of the set, even though the set piece is being scored for uh, the way in which it changes. It can still be a team choice element for what it looks like, um, uh, the effort that they put forth, the methods that they used. Um, it's, really, it's really a very open thing. And there are two of those. Um, on not in the right place. Um, they will be scored for creativity and originality. They will be scored for quality, workmanship, or effort that is evident, and they'll be scored on integration into the presentation. Each one of those gives 10 points as the maximum score, up to 30 points for each, so it's 60 points out of um, the 300 points. 240. But that is actually the next question. So um, oh, wait, before <laughs> we move on from team choice element, a um, couple, couple other things to kind of think about. Um, I think I'm going to steal Marta's analogy. Um, for, for integration to the presentation, a great way to think about that piece, like like Barb said, this is really an opportunity for the kids to explore something that they're really interested in, um, and it still should be connected back to the overall um, presentation. Um, a good way to think about the integration piece, kind of like I talked about before with both the music and lyrics and the spectacle, um, those integration scores, it, it, it should be important to the story. Um, and a good way to think about that is kind of like the story itself and everything around it is the, the cake. And then the team choice elements are the icing. You know, the, the story is going to, the, the cake will still be a cake without the icing. Um, it will still have that base piece. Uh, the team choice elements really enhance it. Um, and so it's just not the same without them. And at the same time, it can stand on its own without them if that if that makes sense for the team choice elements. Um, and a couple of things to keep in mind with the team choice elements, two areas that um, are kind of potential obstacle or things to consider the, with them. Uh, one is, like Barb mentioned, they can't already be scored in the presentation itself in the central challenge. Um, one that's clearly uh, noted in the scoring is that um, music and lyrics because they're being scored for creativity cannot be a team choice element. Um, the, the, the way though that, like Barb mentioned, they can be scored if they are a, 
the musical lyrics can't be scored, but other elements, pieces of the central challenge can be scored if they're able to be pulled off and seen as a separate entity. So one example is just hypothetically the, the spectacle is this magical box. And the spectacle, the technical methods, everything happens within the box and it um, creates a spectacle. And on one side of the box, though, is this beautiful painting that, um, that one of the kids, one of the team members spent days working on. It doesn't affect the technical uh, methods of the, uh, the spectacle, or uh, it doesn't uh, affect the theatrical effect of the spectacle, but it does um, enhance the overall story. So that, that can be pulled off. Um, it does get tricky, and paperwork, again, is going to be key for the appraiser's understanding how this element is separate from another scoring element. Um, and then, uh, so that, so in appraisers, we call that double dipping. And that's something to really, really work with the kids and talk, have the kids talk through what they chose as their team choice element to, um, to double check that it's not being scored elsewhere in the challenge. Um, then the other big piece with team choice elements is that they are going to be scored as a, a whole, um, meaning say there's five dresses um, that the kids have in the presentation. They want, they put down on their paperwork that they would like the dresses to be scored as a team choice element. And uh, three of those dresses are, are average, quality made. One of the dresses they just threw together the, the night before the presentation. And then one of the other dresses they spent months working on this dress. It's intricate. It's obvious that they put in a lot of effort into it and that uh, they, you know, they created it with a novel approach. Um, the way that that would be scored is that it's going to be scored as an average. So all of those dresses, what their overall effect is. Now, if just that one dress, the spectacular dress, is the one that is decided or that is noted on the paperwork to be scored, that is going to be only that is going to be the only piece that the appraisers are looking at to score that element. So just, just something to keep in mind and have the kids really think about is that that's going to be scored um, as an average of all the, the pieces that make up that team choice element as they specify in the paperwork. But um, we've had plenty of, we've had teams where they really want all the dresses scored. Um, and so it's really up to the team uh, what they what they really do want scored. But it's something to something at least to have them discuss when they make that decision. And just to reiterate, because of the nature of this challenge this year, um, please keep the kids, or make sure that the kids understand, like Greg was saying, that the storytelling is a scored element in the first part of the challenge. Therefore, things that help tell the story, like costumes, might affect the first scoring part versus a team choice element. I just want to stress it even a third time, <laughs> although we've all brought it up at least once. So just hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Right, yeah. Nice. Well, real quick, and to play off that, the way the way that appraise, the appraisal team will look at that, so say the the dresses, um, even if they play an intricate part into the story, um, the storytelling, the way that they would score, they would end up um, approaching the clear and effective storytelling, is that they would score it as if there were no dresses. So if though that element was not a part of the, the story. Again, kind of going back to the idea of icing on the cake. The cake is still a cake even without the icing. Um, but if the dresses are integral to clear and effective storytelling, if the story doesn't make sense without those dresses, then that could significantly affect the score, which is 30 points for the central challenge and that piece of the central challenge. So just a, just a discussion point with the team, for sure. All right, last but not least. Oh, wait, we have three more questions. <laughs> um, how many points is the entire central challenge worth? 
Okay, 300, 250, 240, 100. This is a trick question. Okay, 240 is correct. And what that includes is all of the, the four parts that we discussed and the, and the ins, not instant challenge, but the team choice elements. Oh, sorry, Barb, Barb the, the, that only, the 240 only includes the four elements. The, with the team choice elements, it's 300 points total. Right, that's with the 300. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I know it was a tricky that's question. That. that was my fault. <laughs> I did it on purpose. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and something, you know, um, even though the team choice elements, there is that division between the central challenge and the team choice elements, even though integration into the presentation is a key piece of the team choice elements, really we want to emphasize it as an opportunity for the kids to explore something almost outside of the bounds of the the um, the uh, so the the problem posed within the challenge so again yeah we really want the kids to think about that as the team choice elements as a uh, an opportunity onto itself to explore something that they're really interested in okay so now we're going to go on to what is the most common loss of points for teams? Um, missing an element from their solution, an interference deduction, paperwork isn't up to par, or forgot one of their props. Oh, nice, tricky question. Okay, so as Greg has brought up a few times um, in the presentation now, Paperwork is probably the biggest hindrance when it comes to scoring for team members. One of the things that everyone needs to remember, especially the team, the kids, is if it's not on the paperwork, we cannot score it. So one of the examples I like to give is a few years ago, we saw a performance that had these absolutely amazing backdrops and they were um, beautiful and wonderful, but specifically there was this painting on one of the prompts that was spectacular. And nowhere in the paperwork was it a scoring element. So we had to add that score into the creative storytelling. So if you, let me go to this section right here really quick. In the spectacle, if the kids list makeup and then they don't list another spec um, production technique we can only score the one that they listed luckily most of the time prep will try to catch this in their questions before they go into the launch area so most of the time the prep team will find this they will ask the team to choose something but it's really stressful for the team to try to choose a production technique in the last five minutes right before the performance. Paperwork is probably the most important aspect when it comes to scoring. If it's not on the paperwork, we can't score it. Um, which brings me to the next question. Which option from the seven <laughs> deadly sins of paperwork is the worst? Um, the seven double dipping and vastly vague my first novel versus paper saver. Whoops, no paperwork. Where's our team member expenses? Our technical method is... Actually, all the answers are correct in this one. Um, double dipping, Greg already brought that up. Uh, that's where we see a lot of double dipping in the team choice elements versus the rest of the performance. What I just brought up with the paperwork not being specific enough. So let's say the team choice element is one of the team members dancing and they say Zach is dancing. Unfortunately, the appraisers don't know who Zach is. 
So please give us a description. Say Zach is wearing the red costume with the purple tail. That way we know who we're looking for and we'll be expecting to see the dancing. Um, my first novel, <laughs> this is another part of that same idea. While we don't want you to be big, we don't want you to give us three pages of answers for each question. Um, during paperwork, it is totally okay for the team to type up their answers. And if you have a younger team members, it's okay for the parent to write the answers out, but the team has to dictate what those answers are. So you can't fill in the paperwork for them, but you can write out what they're telling you. Not having your paperwork is a nuisance for the rest of the day. We will have extra paperwork at the site, but again, the team does not need that extra stress adding to their day by filling out paperwork because we forgot it at home. The team numbers just as important on there. Uh, the declaration is important, the expenses. Please make sure to have all of those with you the day of the competition. Um, I think the challenge says, please bring three copies. Is that right, Barb? Greg? It should, should, uh, should say five. Yeah. Five. If you guys want to bring us more, like seven or ten, we will not say no to them. Um, it is very <laughs> helpful to have a lot of paperwork for their appraisers because we're sharing those copies. And usually they have about eight minutes between each performance to read the paperwork and go and watch the performance or get into their seats so they can watch the performance. The more clear and concise the paperwork, the easier it is for their appraisers. And then try not to forget to write all the different elements that we need answered in the paperwork. So our, te our technical method is a pulley system that is going to make rows appear. Precise to the point we know what we're looking for, the appraisers will be able to see what they need. Any yeah. questions on paperwork so far? You know, something I was that... just going to mention too, there's, you will see a check as you go through the challenge and wherever the check is, that means there's a corresponding question on the tournament data form and that's what you're going to look for. That Those are the things that need to be explained to the appraisers. And, you know, something to kind of, a way to really think about the paperwork, it's, it's got, like, like Marta's mentioned and I've, I've mentioned before, it's got a very practical purpose as far as helping with scoring for the appraisers and helping have a really smooth day, um, both for, for the team, for the appraisal team, for, for parents, for you as team managers. Um, and at the same time, it's also like, like every, pretty much every element of DI, it's a learning opportunity for the kids. Um, it really emphasizes critical reading of the challenge with the, the questions that, you know, discussing double dipping, the, the um, writing out a first novel versus saving paper. Um, it's really an opportunity for the kids to work on uh, articulating their thoughts and doing that concisely, um, it's a. <laughs> I I have plenty of colleagues that that is a challenge for, and I know that's something that I work on as an adult on a regular basis. It's a huge skill to learn early, and this is an opportunity for them to really work on that. Um, you know, ha not having the paperwork again is something that is a chance for the kids to really think through some of those. Plan A, Plan B, Plan B scenarios. Um, you know what happens if the the person designated paperwork person doesn't show up? Does the team have a Plan B for that or a Plan C? Um, we've you know, we've seen it all on things happening, um, whether it's a, a sick team member or a snowstorm or a broken garage door or whatever it is. It's probably happened. Um, so really thinking through potential uh, obstacles that might lead to how to build in those fail safes for those uh, potential challenges. Um, and then, yeah, technical methods really, um, again, that, that really close reading of the challenge, that, that critical reading ability um, to really 
zero in and understand it and to keep track of the different elements that need to be in place. Um, and then just something also to kind of think about with paperwork as well. Uh, you know, going back to one of our first questions about what what are the goal, what does success look like for the team? You know, maybe maybe scoring all the points that they can get in the challenge isn't isn't what success looks like for the team. That's totally okay. If the team has, you know, it, when they're filling out their paperwork and they're putting things that you as a team manager are, it, you, you're like, no, no, you guys should have this scored, but they really want something else to be, uh, to be scored. You know, as a team manager, you just kind of got to get sit on your hands and let, let the team decide what they want scored. Like, like Marta was saying, there, we've seen plenty of presentations where we wish, um, we wish that particular elements were on the were on the paperwork as scoring elements because as an appraisal team, our we love to give points. <laughs> we we hate when we can't give points for things. And at the same time, it's the kids' decision. It's what they want out of it. And so so it's a good learning experience for all of us as adults, uh, where we want to, you know, we want to to maximize the um, you know the, the points or the grades or whatever it is for our kids. Um, this is a good opportunity for us to just kind of sit on our hands and let the kids make the decisions and determine what what they want to have scored or not scored. But as as your role as a team manager, it's definitely a, a part of your role is having them, you know, working with them to understand how the scoring system works and how paperwork plays a, a role in that. All right. Two more questions and we're almost done. Let you guys out early. <laughs> um, where can a team manager go for more information regarding DI? International DI website, Colorado Fine Arts Facebook page, Kitten Means, or Colorado DI website. Yes. Um, the, we do have a Facebook page that you guys are more than welcome to join if you'd like us to. Just please drop us a comment so we know. The International DI website is a great resource for everyone. Um, the Colorado DI website is also a wonderful resource. If you need those, please let's, let us know. We will um, put those into the comment box on the presentation. Um, very last question. Does anyone have any questions? And are you excited for DI this year? <laughs> I will say we should probably figure out how we can use kid memes to uh, <laughs> present information on DI. I think that would probably be pretty effective. Nice. Oh awesome. no, there's a few threes. <laughs> Please, we are here to help you guys. Um, whatever you need from the Challenge Masters, me, Barb, and Greg are always open to any questions. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is via text. If you guys want to write down my cell phone number, now's the time. Giving you guys a few minutes. Okay, 303. Again, you can ask this for in the comments. 303-204-9213. Feel free to text me. Please let me know that you're calling from DI so I don't respond in some odd manner. Um, again, Facebook is a great option if you guys want to post questions in our Facebook page. We will post the um, emails for all the challenge masters in the Facebook group. And if you'd like those, please drop a comment in here. We can email those to you as well. Um, what are your guys' concerns? Please drop them into the chat question um, chat box so we know what they are. We will try to answer them now. If not, you can always call us or email us. Okay, I can add my um, cell phone also, and text would also be my preferred method of communication. So I'm 303 859 5661. And this is Barb. 
And then for me, and for me, email is going to be the best way. Um, so my email address is G E C O L L E T T E at gmail.com. And uh, kind of like Marta, if you can put in the subject line that it's, it's something about destination imagination um, in the subject line, that way my Gmail is getting pretty aggressive about filtering things out that I don't necessarily want filtered out. So um, just put that in the subject line and uh, that'll make sure that I get it. Any questions? Um, please let us know how you like the quiz as well, since this is the first time we've tried it. And it was a experiment, to say the least. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all for for being our guinea pigs. We really, really appreciate it. All righty, any questions that we have to answer? I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Like like we said, don't hesitate to ask us a question. We we are here for you all. Um, whether it's a question specific to the challenge, um, it's a uh, question related to being a team manager or you just need somebody to vent to, we completely understand. Um, and that's really, that's what we're here for. So don't hesitate at all to reach out to us. All righty. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It was great. Um, and right. thank you for Thanks for speaking with us. Yeah. Bye.